Dr. Brent Boss, who uh, spoke to us in 2007 about the Mars Phoenix lander, the first to set down in a high southern latitude near the fringes of the south polar cap on Mars. That made him a friend of GRAAA and also a uh, big fan of the Roger B. Chaffee Planetarium, but that goes back even further because he tells us that during a field trip to the planetarium when he was a kid, that's what first got him turned on to space science. Well, that might not be the total story, but uh, we're really pleased to hear about that. And he has since gone on to a very distinguished career. And I'm gonna give you just a couple of highlights before we let Brent tell you all about his latest project. He majored in honors physics at the University of Michigan. Go blue. I see, I see you're wearing your, yes, there he is. Yes, Bra probably wearing the block M. Um, then it was on to the University of Arizona for a grad school where he joined the Mars Atmospheric and Geologic Imaging Team at the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. He completed his PhD in 2002 which dealt with the design, and uh, listen to this carefully, design, calibration, and operation of Mars lander cameras. Hmm. That's a pretty big bite. That led to major involvement with the Mars Phoenix mission and also to work on development of the Webb Space Telescope. Then came involvement with OSIRIS-REx, which is the big project and the hot topic right now. And that began in the summer, uh, summer of uh, 2010. This is a probe with a rather tricky effort to snatch a sample of the asteroid Bennu and then return it to the Earth. This has been a decade long project and I'm thinking that last October Dr. Boss was one very excited guy, having seen how successful that has been, at least so far, it's still underway. A couple of other um, items of note before we allow the presentation. Dr. Boss has continued to contribute to ongoing development of the Chaffee Planetarium. And that is as a member of the advisory board for the major planetarium upgrade in 2013 and 2014. And he also, as we've already mentioned earlier, consulted with Jack and John uh, in the development of their current show at the planetarium, OSIRIS-REx. And uh, it's about OSIRIS-REx, it's entitled Incoming, that and, and other uh, space programs. Here's something that's quite interesting. Dr. Boss has contributed to 31 United States patents as an inventor. Hmm. That's your sideline. He was awarded the NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal in June of 2016 for work as a NASA civil servant. And in May of 2016, the IAU named an asteroid Brent Boss in honor of his contribu contributions to various space missions. So now that makes me the proud uh, I, person to know Two, I'm now fortunate to know two people that have had asteroids named after them. While a West Michiganer, uh, well, still a West Michigander at heart, his professional pursuits carried him first to Arizona and now to uh, Maryland and to the Goddard Space, Site, uh, Space Center near Washington, DC, where he lives with his wife and three not so young anymore children. <laughs> so as the father of three active teenagers and a very busy scientist, we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule this evening to speak to us about bombshells from Bennu, Dr. Brent Boss. And we are all applauding virtually. Thanks, Dave, and thanks, Chris, for inviting me. Let me let me see if this sharing will work and everything. Chris and I worked out this earlier, so I want to make sure everything's set up before we jump in. So let's see here. Oh, can you let me in, Chris? It says that you have to let me. 
give me permission. All right, it looks like there. We'll share sound this time. All right, can folks see my screen? Is that a thumbs up? Yes. Oh, good. So Chris, um, why could you monitor the chat the way I've done these in the past seems to work pretty well. If people have questions, maybe you could monitor the chat and break in if there's kind of a breaking one that I can answer in real time. Otherwise we can spend mm -hmm. as long as people want answering questions at the end. But if it looks like it would really make sense to interrupt, then go ahead and, and do that. So um, I'm really happy to be invited to talk to you guys tonight. It's really, for those of us at NASA, it's our honor, honor and privilege to get out and share with the community, particularly people that are interested in the work we do. And for those of you that are federal taxpayers, we work for you. This is your project. This is your space uh, organization. And hopefully we're doing work that you feel is valuable. Um, unlike what we were talking about earlier, I think Carlton was talking about wasting taxpayers' dollars. I'm hoping that after I get done to talk about the exciting things we did on OSIRIS-REx that you'll feel like it was money uh, well spent. Um, so I, I have quite a bit to cover tonight. I'm just gonna jump right into it. So first I'll give you a little overview of the OSIRIS-REx mission, talk about why we went to this particular asteroid anyway. And then I'll talk about two of the surprising things that I was heavily involved with as part of the mission. And then end with talk about what the, what the current plans are in the future. Um, work that's left to do. So OSIRIS-REx uh, is, is an asteroid sample return mission and OSIRIS-REx actually is, uh, it is an acronym, it's a rather tortured acronym. However, um, our original leader for some reason really wanted to stick with this Egyptian mythology theme. So we have this really tortured acronym and OSIRIS-REx stands for Origins, Spectral Interpretation, Resource Identification, Security, Regolith Explorer. And so, I'll touch on a few of those words as we as we go through the as I go through the presentation, uh, but this mission had been proposed a number of time in kind of the 2000s uh, time frame. It was finally on its third competition when it was selected by NASA headquarters back in May of 2011, and uh, the original head of the mission was one of my former professors at the University of Arizona, Mike Drake, who was a really great guy, this really nice Englishman who was a, really a geochemist. Um, but unfortunately, soon after we were selected, he passed away about six months after uh, headquarters selected the mission. And we ended up um, choosing a new lead for the mission who was still at the University of Arizona. So that is still the, the main academic institution that's involved in, in leading the work. Um, we launched in September of 2016 and we arrived at our target asteroid, which is called Bennu, or sometimes I'll call it RQ-36. The original name was 1999 RQ-36. It got renamed Bennu in a big student uh, uh, contest that we had where an elementary student ended up coming with the name Bennu, which ties into the Egyptian mythology theme of the, of the Osiris-Rex name. Um, we finally reached Bennu after cruising in space a little over two years in October. Uh, about two years ago. And we've studied the asteroid for almost two years until we attempted our first and ended up being our only sample acquisition attempt just recently in uh, October of 2020. And as I'll show you, we believe we've collected our minimum amount of material that's required for, for mission success, which is 60 grams. And the plan is to re return to Earth and land in Utah in September of 2023. So give you a little idea of the size of the things that we're talking about here. So in the upper left is an early artist rendition, actually. This was in our proposal of what the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft looks like. And it kind of gives you an idea of the scale. I'll show you a real picture in, in a little bit. But it's pretty good size for a planetary spacecraft. So it's about seven meters on a side. We're powered solely by uh, solar power. So we have these big solar arrays. And when we can't have sun falling on those, then we have lithium ion batteries that maintain uh, power to all the instruments. We have um, a number of instruments on board, some, uh, one that does observations in the X-ray part of the spectrum, but most of them either work in the visible or the near infrared part of the spectrum out to about uh, 25 microns. Uh, we also have several laser altimeters on board to measure surface topography. And then one of the other key things I'll point out here is this thing called TAGSAM. 
So that's what's shown uh, right here. So tag SAM is what we use to touch down on the asteroid surface and also acquire the sample, which takes place at the end of the arm right here. And then the other key component to point out is the SRC or the sample return capsule, which is shown there. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of the real thing in a little bit, but that's our spacecraft. Um, and then on the other side here, you've got something quite a bit bigger. So this is a, a early artist rendition of Bennu shown in scale with respect to the Great Pyramid at Giza. So it's big, but it's not as big as a lot of asteroids. It's only about 500 meters in diameter and the bulk density is quite low. Um, and in fact, it's, it's not large enough and it's, and it's not uh, dense enough to generate enough gravity to force itself into a sphere. And to operate around it is really more like rendezvousing with another spacecraft. We're talking micro G's compared to what you would have here on Earth. So it's a very delicate process, which we'll talk a little bit about, about getting in orbit and then making sure that you stay in orbit because it takes very little energy to uh, leave the gravity field of a, a small body like that. And that was one of the challenges early on um, when we were planning the mission. So I'll give you a little idea. Here's some, some actual pictures. So this was one of the spectrometers that we built for the mission. This was the only piece of actual hardware we built at NASA. Um, and this is called OVIRS. This was a visible and infrared spectrometer shown on the optics bench just as we were getting ready to ship it down to Lockheed Martin where the spacecraft was being assembled. And that's what the next picture shows you. So kind of keeping your your mind's eye here, what this looks like just sitting on the table with a few of us standing around it. And then this is a picture of what it looks like on the spacecraft itself. So here's OVIRS. And this is the flight, all the flight hardware, pretty much the way it was before we launched. We don't have the solar arrays on here, but everything else you see, except for the things that have a red color to them, everything else flew um, and was launched into space towards Bennu. This picture was taken while while we were doing some tag SAM operations checkouts and making sure everything was working properly. So here you can see tag SAM kind of laid out horizontally here in the image. You can see we have a bag on the sample head. We're trying to keep it very clean to make sure anything we found in the head after we do our sampling attempt is actually from the asteroid and, and not from somewhere else like on Earth, which wouldn't be very interesting. Um, this right here is actually part of the ground support equipment. So this isn't normally part of TAGSAM, but TAGSAM was built to operate in a zero G or microgravity environment. And it's not strong enough to support itself in a one G environment. So anytime we moved it around, we had to attach this to a large helium balloon, which is actually out of the field of view of this picture here. So anytime we were in this big clean room down at Lockheed Martin, uh, just, out, just south of Denver, Kind of felt like you were in a carnival area because this this helium balloon large one was always just kind of floating around in there and that's what we had to use anytime we moved the tag sam a few other things to point out on the spacecraft here are two of the cameras these are two of the cameras i was responsible for navcam one and navcam two we'll show you some images from that later this is one of the laser altimeters that was provided by the canadian space agency and there were some other laser altimeters here um, that uh, uh, Lockheed Martin procured and put on the spacecraft. Uh, I already mentioned OVIRS, so this is a spectrometer, allows us to look at spectra of that comes from the surface of Bennu. And right next to it is a thermal emission spectrometer. That's what this big opening is right here. That was a, a spectrometer built by Arizona State University and goes all the way out to 25 microns, so we can look at thermal emission of the, uh, of the asteroid surface. Right next to that is Polycam. That's our largest aperture um, instrument on board. It's 200 uh, centimeters. And this is what we use to uh, identify Bennu when it still was just a pinpoint of light and allowed us to navigate towards the asteroid. Right next to it is another camera called MapCam. Um, and then there's a third camera that's part of this camera suite, all built by the University of Arizona, the, the old group I came from. And then there's a third camera as part of that group called SAMCAM, which you'll see some images for later that was built to image this head in, in different orientations. Um, right behind those cameras, this is called Rexus. That was the X-ray experiment on board, and it was built by a group of students from Harvard and MIT. And then there's one other camera called Stocam, which is the third camera I was responsible for, which you can't see as well 
Albert is pointed right at the sample return capsule. So here's what the real sample return capsule looks like. And this is the only part of the spacecraft that's going to come back uh, to Earth in uh, 2023. All right, so we get a lot of questions um, about, okay, why Bennu or RQ-36? Why this particular asteroid? And this chart actually goes back to the proposal stage of the mission. And when we were proposing the mission, we knew we wanted to be able to go to an asteroid and get a sample. Um, back then, there were a little over half a million asteroids that were known at the time. Now I think the catalog is up to, it might even be over a million now. But that, that's still, you know, half a million asteroids is still a lot. But in order to go to an asteroid with enough mass on the spacecraft, enough fuel to go there, fly down to the surface, and then retrieve a sample and come back, we knew we were going to have to go to a near-Earth asteroid, so we wouldn't have to go out uh, too far, and all the orbital mechanics would be sort of low energy to try to get to a body like that. So from that about half million uh, potential asteroids, that narrowed us down to 8,000 near-Earth asteroids. Um, once we took a look at those, um, we realized there were about a few hundred, about 300 of those bodies were actually optimum from a sample return standpoint. Uh, we'd be able to launch on vehicles that are currently available, you know, launch vehicles, rockets, and we'd be able to bring enough mass to those bodies to study it, look for the most interesting place to take a sample, and then grab a sample and have enough fuel to get back to Earth. So that got us down to something a little bit more reasonable. Then the next criteria was of those 300, we wanted to go to a body that was at least 200 meters in diameter. And there were two reasons for that. The orbital dynamicists were telling us if you go to a body smaller than 200 meters, it's likely to be spinning um, too fast and could even be tumbling. So it could be spinning about multiple axes. So that would obviously be very difficult to try and land a spacecraft on. And the geologists on the team were telling us you want to go to an object bigger than 200 meters because it's likely if you go to something smaller than that, it's going to be a very consolidated body with a, without a lot of fine material that would that would lend itself to uh, to sample acquisition. It would be difficult to bring up a sample. So using that criteria of uh, 200 meters or larger, that got us down to uh, 27 uh, bodies. So then you're starting to have a list that is a lot easier to work with. So then the kind of see the key science questions started to come into play at that point. And one of the goals for the mission, um, and that's where the origins part of our acronym comes from, one of the primary goals of the mission was to go to a, an, an asteroid, a carbonaceous asteroid, which probably has, uh, could be the type of body that seeded the uh, carbon material or, or early organics here on Earth from which life sprung. And that was one of the primary science goals of the mission. So that got us down to five bodies. Um, and we ended up selecting Bennu or RQ-36 because it was the one we knew the most about. We didn't know a lot about it, but of the five bodies that sort of met all those criteria, Bennu was clearly the obvious choice. So a little more information on Bennu. Um, again, it's a near-Earth asteroid. Uh, the original name tells you it was discovered during the first half of September in 1999. So we really haven't known about it all that long. Um, and again, it's not that big of a body, about a third of a mile in, in diameter, not large enough for gravity to force it into the shape of a sphere. These images in the upper right here are actually shape models developed from radar observations that we made here from Earth, um, from Arecibo actually, thinking about uh, you know recent, recent events with Arecibo. But this was uh, radar observations from Arecibo that we created a shape model from. And you'll see later, it's, it, it's pretty close to what we encountered. It kind of has this walnut shape to it. Um, and again, it's scientifically important for two primary reasons. One is it's a carbonaceous asteroid, a B-type carbonaceous asteroid. So it's possible for us to, if we get a sample to test out the hypothesis that things like that could have seeded um, life or from which life could have seeded earth with organics from which life could have sprung on the early earth. The other reason this, this asteroid is, is interesting is it's actually, it is a near earth asteroid and it has a non-zero chance of hitting us uh, in the not too distant future. So in 2169, there's a small chance this body could hit us. And that's where the, the part of the acronym, the security in the acronym comes from. And so one of the other goals of this mission was to fly out to the body, study it, develop a shape model, measure its albedo, because for these small bodies, it's not just Newtonian mechanics 
which determines the orbit, but the sunlight that's always uh, shining on it also makes the orbit evolve over time. And so that's why when you hear about these bodies getting discovered that it may hit us, there's always a certain uncertainty associated with that because of these types of effects. And so one of the effects in particular that we're trying to measure during the mission is something called the Arkovsky effect, which is how the asteroid's orbit is affected when it absorbs sunlight on the day side and then rotates and re-emits infrared photons into space. And so that's one of our goals as well is over time to use what we've learned about, at, about the asteroid right now and be able to predict how the orbit evolves over time. So here you can see, um, it's a little small, but now that everybody's at home, this probably comes through a little bit better. So here's a, a diagram of the inner solar system. The green line is Earth's orbit. And then this blue line here is Bennu's orbit. So you can see it spends quite a bit of time closer to the sun than what the Earth does and that the orbit's inclined a little bit with respect to Earth. So that's the background. Now I want to kind of take you, try to fast forward through launch and everything that happened kind of in that two year time frame as we were getting ready to go about orbit around Bennu. So I have a quick um, little video to show you. Hopefully the sound will come through. The OSIRIS-REx spacecraft launched in 2016, and it's actually taken us two years to get to the asteroid Bennu. And in that time, we had an Earth flyby. So we used an Earth flyby in 2017 to change the plane of our orbit to match Bennu's orbit plane. And it's also provided a great opportunity from a flight dynamics perspective to really calibrate our models and learn how to fly this. Uh -oh. It froze on my screen too. Hold on. There spacecraft, we go. which will help us in the really challenging part of the mission, which is orbiting in the low gravity environment of the asteroid. Over the past few months, the Flight Dynamics team has been getting images of the asteroid Bennu, and it started out as just a very small point source in the camera, and it's been getting bigger and bigger and bigger in the field of view. And that's allowed us to perform optical navigation to refine our uh, prediction of the asteroid's orbit uh, and allow us to more precisely navigate and target our approach to the asteroid. As OSIRIS-REx approaches the asteroid, we've done a series of braking maneuvers called asteroid approach maneuvers to slow down the spacecraft so that we can get into orbit around the asteroid later this year. We're also taking lots of images of Bennu to understand its rotation, look for natural satellites, and potential dust plumes. This is an extremely exciting time on OSIRIS-REx as we're just poised at arrival at Bennu. And one of the most exciting things to us, and relieving too to the engineers, is how closely the asteroid has resembled what we had predicted. Early on, our science team, prior to launch, had come up with a model of what they thought the asteroid would look like based purely on ground-based radar observations from Arecibo. And from that, they created a reference asteroid that we used as the requirements to design the mission against. But no one could be sure that the asteroid would really look like the scientists had predicted. So it's been a tremendous relief to us to find that the actual Bennu is very similar to what the scientists had predicted. So the science team really nailed it. Well, right now as we're approaching asteroid Bennu, we're looking for debris or other objects that are orbiting the asteroid, just in case we need to avoid those. And then once we arrive on December 3rd, we'll perform preliminary survey. And in preliminary survey, we fly over the North Pole, South Pole, and the middle of the asteroid. This helps us to map the gravity of the asteroid and understand how to operate near such a small body. Additionally, this will be the first time that we get close-up pictures of the surface, and we'll know how smooth or rocky the surface that we're going to study is. As we get closer to asteroid Bennu, we'll begin to map its surface in higher detail. What we'll be able to do is first identify the distribution of rocks and particles that might pose a hazard to the sampling mechanism on the spacecraft. And we'll also get a better sense of what the shape of Bennu is like at smaller scales. Looking at Bennu in more and more detail is gonna help us identify all the areas that we shouldn't go to grab a sample from. Throughout 2019, we'll be doing global characterization of the asteroid, basically making maps of the entire surface. We're interested in its topography. Are there craters? Where are the boulders, the valleys, the mountains of the asteroid? And then we want to understand the distribution of geologic materials. Are we finding different patches of minerals in one location versus another? And why are certain areas that have a composition and others may be different? We're going to be looking most importantly for areas where we can collect a sample. 
OSIRIS-REx will collect a sample from Bennu using our TAGSAM, which is the Touch and Go Sample Acquisition Mechanism. What that is, is an arm connected to this sampler head that you see here. This is similar in size to an air filter from a car. How this mechanism works is there's compressed gas that is released that will stir up the regolith from Bennu, store it into this canister, which we will then put inside of our sample release capsule and bring back to Earth. We will collect the sample of Bennu in 2020 and return it to Earth in 2023. Once we're in the vicinity of our home world, about four and a half hours before impacting the top of the atmosphere, the spacecraft spins up and releases that sample return capsule. The spacecraft fires its engines to perform a deflection burn, going off into orbit around the sun, and the return capsule enters the Earth's atmosphere, targeting a landing in the Utah desert. I'll be there on site when we open that capsule up and we see those samples for the first time. And science begins at that point on the next phase of the mission, the sample analysis period. All right, so that shows you kind of where we were at about a little over two years ago. So we were just, it was late 2019, and we were getting ready to go into orbit around Bennu. Um, and if you remember, unfortunately, all of a sudden we were surprised with sort of our first uh, uh, crisis to deal with, and that was the federal government shut down because Congress and the president couldn't agree on a budget back then in 2018. And so at that point, all of us NASA folks weren't allowed to work anymore. Um, fortunately, we were able to get special permission, a few of us to work without pay for the period, but we were able to actually still execute the burn to put ourselves into orbit. And as was, we were talking about in the animation, we were constantly using images to figure out where we were with respect to Bennu and making sure we were staying in orbit. Since again, we're in this low gravity situation where it's very difficult to stay in orbit and easy to leave orbit. And so we were constantly taking pictures every day during this time period. And on January 6th, we took these two images, which are shown here, on the upper left and the upper right. So we take a series of images, uh, short exposures and long exposures. These are the long exposures, which allow us to um, determine where Bennu is and then the, the, and look at the star fields with respect to that. And that helps us navigate and figure out where we are in, in space. Well, when we were looking at these images after they came down, we noticed they looked a little different than the other ones we had seen. So if you look at these insets that are blown up here, you can see it looks like there's little points of light that are coming off of Bennu. And it certainly looked like uh, Bennu was shedding material, which was a surprise, particularly since we had looked for that kind of activity with some of the other cameras from a, a distance further away. We had looked for natural satellites and never found them. But once we got closer and started to use a different camera with a wide field of view, all of a sudden we saw this and two, only two frames, however. I mean, it looked like you could correlate some of the motion frame to frame, um, but these were unresolved point sources of light. They just they looked like they could be stars, but stars that happened to be moving. And so we weren't sure if this was real or not. And in fact, in some other long exposure images, we had seen unresolved points like this that were caused by radiation events inside the detectors of the cameras themselves. So it is possible that these two images were just two radiation events with little particle uh, uh, anomalies that happened to correlate. So we weren't really sure what we were looking at. We were excited, but we weren't sure. So a big start, we had to kind of gin up a big start, a big study, of course, with the people that were still around. We didn't have a full team working at that point, but we had to figure out what the cause was because this could be obviously potentially very exciting from a scientific standpoint because asteroids generally aren't active. It's comets, right? That when they come close to the, come close to the sun and the inner solar system, they start to heat up and they, do, they start to become active. But active asteroids are not particularly well known in our solar system. They're only about four or five before um, we saw this behavior on Bennu. So it was potentially a real exciting scientific discovery, but could be other things too, like this radiation event. Um, there were some other causes we were also considering. So we had a whole fishbone diagram. We had to start tracking down and trying to figure out what was happening. But at the same time, we said, well, if this is real, we need to try and study it and study it better so that we can characterize it. And so we kind of put in an emergency set of observations 
tuned to try to look for this behavior if it was really happening. And we were able to get those commands ready and all planned out and radiated up to the spacecraft on January 11, then in 2019. At the same time, while we were still trying to figure out if this was real or not, we started to improve the tools that we could use to analyze um, these types of events, if in fact they were real. Fortunately, we didn't have to chase down every potential on that fishbone diagram because Bennu only about a week later cooperated with us and shed particles again. And this time we had a multiple we showed the behavior in multiple images. So here are four of the frames that we took on January 19, processed in a little bit different way, but you can see these streaks of light. Again, they're still unresolved, little points of light, just a few pixels in size, but with multiple frames now taken closer in time together, it was much easier to correlate that, yeah, this is the same particle frame to frame. And so this was very exciting. We were able to throw away all the analyses that were looking at other effects. And this was not happening in the detector or anything else with the spacecraft. This was something real happening at Bennu. And we were really excited. So at that same time, just over that week period, we started to develop these better tools. So I'm gonna show you kind of some of the early results of, of those uh, tools we developed in that short period of time. So I'm gonna show you a little animation right now, which shows a tool we developed to track these little unresolved points of light. And what the tool does, it looks at these images it removes everything in the background that it knows about. So it removes Bennu, it removes catalog stars and anything else that we know is in the solar system is in the field of view. And anything left is stuff we don't know. Now, some of it is noise, as you'll see. But if you look closely, you'll be able to see that it actually identifies particles and shows little dots that show uh, the orbital uh, trajectory of, of these little bodies. So this is just using the images and you can see there are some there, it just looks like noise. And then you'll see others where it's obvious. Yeah, like there's a track right there. You'll also see when we get up to January 19, you'll see that, that you'll see a bunch of particles come off. And there was a pretty nice trajectory as well. So with this type of tool, we're able to almost automatically identify particles, whereas initially we had started basically, it was doing it by hand. There was a nice trajectory there you saw on the, on the left-hand side. And you can see there were a lot of these, in particular for these large events, when there is an ejection event, we're talking hundreds of particles. So it would be very tedious to try to do this manually. So we started to develop these tools to do it automatically. At the same time, our ability to analyze kind of these single frames got better. So this is actually, one of our best process frames from the January 6th event, the initial event that um, led our attention or, or grabbed our attention. So here you can see, here's Bennu and here's the material um, flying off of it. And then we have another nice image from January 19. Again, not quite as big as the January 6th event, but clearly there's material that's leaving Bennu. So using these types of tools, we're able to identify these particles um, and track them. And once you have enough observations, you can do orbital fits to the trajectory of the particles. And so that's what kind of the last step was. So what I'll show you now is kind of the, the final output, at least for some of the bigger events we saw over the first eight months. And it's an animation of all the particles that we were able to identify and then fit orbits to. So this was the January 19 event. The blue line is, is uh, the spacecraft orbit, and then all the yellow uh, tracks are these particles that are being ejected. And here's an event from February 11. One from August 28. And I think the next one is it shows you a really nice ejection. The camera had a really good view. Yeah, so of course this was very exciting to us, not just replaying again. And we spent a lot of time, um, made a lot of observations uh, to be able to understand the activity. And we finally published it uh, in a peer reviewed article in Science um, almost a year ago now, in December of 2019, here's the reference. Um, and I pulled out some of the more interesting figures from that publication, um, at least from my perspective. So this plot here on the left, shows you the number of particles we were able to detect versus 
day of the year. So here's, of course, the first event that we that we saw. And then you can see here when we started this um, specific imaging campaign to look for this kind of activity, now you start to see um, these little blue blocks here showing that we're detecting particles. So the color coding is the, the purple lines are kind of major events. The orange uh, code shows uh, kind of minor events. And then the turquoise color, at least on my screen, shows up as turquoise. That just shows that it's not necessarily an event, but we, we observed particles in the vicinity of Bennu and most of them had stable orbits. On the right-hand side here, you can see that once you have at least enough observations, you can start to play those trajectories uh, in reverse time and try to figure out where on the surface the particles might have originated from. Unfortunately, we don't have pre and post imaging of these areas. Um, so we just have um, kind of one image. So it'd be really, it'd be really nice. It would have been nice to be able to have an image before the ejection event and after. Because one of the things we were trying to figure out was um, what's causing this. So these images right here show you the lines correspond to kind of an uncertainty um, using just the first few observations of a particle. And then these yellow ones, at least in these last two, um, show you where we think they originated if we use all the orbital, all the, the orbits that we fit to a particular event. So unfortunately, like I said, these images didn't give us a lot of insight into what was really causing this. In the paper, we listed a number of different mechanisms that we thought were viable, but they're really top, there were kind of three that were at the top of our list. When we published the paper, kind of the leading theory was that this was caused by thermal fracturing because all the events, particularly the major events were happening kind of in a late afternoon, kind of around uh, 2.30, uh, local time or 3.30. And um, so the idea there is, you know, the body gets really cold when it's pointed at space. And then as that surface starts to turn around, it heats up. And then in the late afternoon, it's it sort of reaches its maximum temperature. And you have thermal stresses that cause the rocks to crack. And it doesn't take a lot of energy for that to release, um, you know, in this low gravity environment for these particles then to leave the surface. Um, at the moment, we think though our, our second uh, idea at the time is probably more, more likely. And that is that Bennu is sort of living in the same micrometeoroid environment as the earth does. And just like we're always getting pelted by rocks, Bennu is, also has that same kind of incoming flux. And so um, that's our leading right now because as we continue to see these events after we publish this paper, we see that um, it's not necessarily always in the late afternoon that these events happen and you have these major events. Um, the other possible um, hypothesis was that this was caused again by heating up, but that you were having volatiles that were trapped inside of the phyllo silicates starting to expand and crack little holes in the rock. And again, it doesn't take a lot of energy to lift these particles off the surface. Um, and of course, it could be any combination of these. All of these things could be going on. We just don't know at this point. But those are probably still the three leading theories with the micrometeoroid impact being the most likely cause. Um, as we studied the, the, the bodies, um, we found that they tend to do one of three things, as you might expect. Um, some of them have enough energy that they take a hyperbolic trajectory and leave the gravity influence of Bennu. Um, other ones go up and they come right back down. And then about a third of them end up having semi-stable orbits. And their orbits last for about a week, sometimes up to two weeks. And that was telling us that, wow, this, there must be these ejection events almost constantly if a particle has a stable orbit of only about a week or two. And anytime we look, we're always seeing particles. That means that we're not catching all the ejection events. So there must always be some kind of ejection mechanism that's in operation to constantly repopulate um, the particles that we see around Bennu. And fortunately, they aren't moving that quickly. So they're about, and they're not that large. So they're about the size of a, of a softball. And of course, our spacecraft folks were very interested in this because initially when we found out this was real, the big question was, should we stay in orbit or should we back away and make sure that uh, 
we don't hurt ourselves in this environment. But once we started to build up some observations, uh, we could develop statistics on size and speed. And the folks that actually do the analysis to figure out how much risk you're incurring by launching through all the crud that's in Earth orbit uh, when you launch, they use the same type of analyses and models to estimate what the risk was to, to damage the spacecraft and found out it was actually less, quite a bit less risk, in fact, for us to remain in orbit and continue our science observations than it was to launch in the first place. So we never did leave orbit because of, because of these observations. So in my mind, that was one of the really exciting things about the whole science observation phase of the mission. Um, as was talked about in the video, we were doing a lot of other things at the same time, but this was a big surprise. And, and I think this is one of the more interesting things that happened as part of that observation phase. So I'm gonna show you another short little uh, video that kind of takes you through up to the point where we were in just the, about September of this past year. So just as we were getting ready to go down and attempt our first sample acquisition on the asteroid. As we started to approach Bennu from a distance and it started to fill up the camera field of view, it looked exactly like we thought it would, with a few boulders sticking out. But as we got closer, we expected to see a very sandy surface with maybe a few boulders here and there. And what we saw is very little sand. And we saw these mountains, we saw boulders, we saw rocks, and we saw very few areas that had this sandy surface that we were expecting and what we had designed to. We have never done this before. We're actually gonna collect a sample and bring it back down to Earth for further examination by scientists. In order to achieve that objective, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has been navigating around Bennu for about the last two years, studying it in great detail, and also overcoming a number of challenges that Bennu has presented. We were looking for locations on Bennu that were 50 meters in diameter, relatively flat, and covered with fine grain material. And by fine grain material, I mean stuff that's the size of a dime or smaller. We realized that there were no sites on Bennu that even came close to meeting this criteria. Everywhere we looked was too small and covered with boulders. So we actually had to fly a number of additional close passes over the asteroid and rethink our entire plan for grabbing the sample. After the additional observations of Bennu, we had to down-select to four sites and then go back and survey those sites even further to select the final primary sample site. My first impression of Nightingale is that's the last place I wanted to go. But as we started looking at other sites, we saw that one, this is probably one of the most sampleable sites, and two, we were overperforming in our navigation capability and our ability to contact. Natural feature tracking works a lot like the human mind in that we pick up landmarks along the way. As we descend, we look at features on the ground. We program the computer to recognize certain features. It takes a picture, says this feature is not where I expected it to be. It's a little bit off to the side. Updates its position based on where it's pointed and where that feature shows up in the camera position. The tag event is our touch and go event, which is where we'll actually be retrieving the sample from asteroid Bennu. We start with a series of maneuvers, one of them being the checkpoint burn, which is where we'll actually check our position velocity in relation to the sample site. And then the match point burn, about 10 minutes later, will zero out our horizontal velocity relative to the surface. And then about 10 minutes after that, we make contact with the tag sam, fire the gas bottle, and then back away. And we hope to get at least 60 grams of sample and then we'll be able to store that and bring it back down to Earth. But there are several things that could go wrong and we also have to be prepared that we won't be successful on our first try at Nightingale. We don't only get one shot at TAG, we actually have three nitrogen bottles on board the spacecraft so we can potentially do three TAG attempts if needed. We go through several what-if scenarios and this is how we actually prepare for a lot of our contingencies. So we've had to look all around the surface and identify the rocks and boulders that if the spacecraft were to tip over up to 25 degrees, it could come into contact and be damaged. We had to develop a hazard map, which we program into the computer and says, if you're getting too close to those hazards, we'll do a wave off, we'll back away from the asteroid, and we'll come back and do this another day. Everything might work perfectly. We come down, we touch the surface just where we want to, we fire the gas bottle, but the area we contact is covered in large rocks. Those rocks would prevent any fine gray material from being stirred up and captured in the tag sand head. 
Another similar scenario is if the tag sand were to touch on the edge of a boulder and become tipped up. In that case, when the gas bottle fires, much of that gas escapes out the side, not churning up the material that we want to capture. The day of tag is going to be really exciting, but the excitement for our team doesn't end there. We have to verify that we have a proper sample. First, we're going to image the tag sand head by sticking it in front of one of the cameras. Then we're going to do a maneuver called the sample mass measurement in which we stick out the arm and we spin the spacecraft in order for us to decide if we've collected enough mass to be able to stow the sample and return home or if we have to try again. This is the culmination of a lot of work. It's probably one of the most exciting missions that I've worked on. It is really exciting to know that we're finally going to be able to touch the surface of the asteroid and collect the sample to return back to Earth. All right, so that's where our heads were uh, not that long ago. This is all like recent history still. So uh, this is all still sort of fresh in all of our minds and it's been really exciting. So sample acquisition day was October 20, which is this, this past year. Uh, so here's the overall diagram of what things look like in the inner solar system. You can see it's kind of interesting, actually. Bennu was one of the farthest things away from us, over 2.2 AU at that point when we were attempting this. Um, on the right-hand side, you see a map of where we thought all the interesting carbonates was, and then our touchdown location here in the Nightingale site. So I'm going to sh first show you uh, a series of images from this camera called SAMCAM, which was pointed at the sample head as we were flying down to the surface. And you'll, you'll see us make contact and then briefly pull away. So there's Tag Sam. We're going to straighten up the head here right before we make contact. And then you can see we just kind of like punch right into the surface, almost offered, it offered very little resistance. And then you see we kind of made a mess of things as we pulled away. Now I'm going to show you another series of images. These were taken by NavCam2. And these are the actual images that the spacecraft used to make sure it was on the right trajectory and going to the right place to try to acquire the sample. And this takes place from um, Bennu's orbit and then ends about a minute and a half after we actually touch down. So here we are, we're about ready to leave Bennu's orbit. And like it said in the, in the video clip, the spacecraft is taking these images to try to make sure that it's on the right trajectory and going to the right place. And it's comparing these images with what we had told it the surface looked like along its trajectory. So there you can see the tag site just almost out of the frame because the limit is pointed. You're able to see the shadow of the tag sand arm come into play here. And the touchdown side is just to the right of center. So there we touch down, and now we're starting to back away. And you can see all this material that we kicked up. And it looks really chaotic and, and sort of difficult to understand exactly what's happening. But I'll show you a little bit. We'll close, do a close up um, on what was happening in particular in this. Very interesting in what was happening here from a surface strength standpoint and just all the interesting physics that was happening in this microgravity environment. But of course, we didn't see these images right away. It took, some of these didn't even come down until the next day. Our first indication that things had gone well or, or something had happened at least was the telemetry from uh, some sensors that were on board the spacecraft. So uh, one of the first things we got back over telemetry was an indication that this sensor, the forearm of the tag SAM had never in fact tripped. So the tag SAM actually has a spring um, in its forearm. And when that gets compressed to a certain level, there was a sensor on board that would trip and tell us that, yeah, we made contact, go ahead and blow the nitrogen bottle, try to acquire a sample, and then start the back away maneuver a few seconds later. Well, once we got the telemetry down, we found out that sensor, in fact, never tripped. And so that told us that the surface never even put up that much resistance as we we're trying to touch down. Think about you know, what kind of surface is this? It's obviously very weak. And once you do the math, that the amount of force that the surface pushed back with was less than 15 pounds here on, here on Earth. So you can think about like a, a adult bowling ball is about 15 pounds and the type of surfaces you could put that on and it would offer very little resistance. So we started to talk about Bennu's surface, at least this particular area of the asteroid 
having the surface strength of like a, a freshly fallen snow. So it offered almost no resistance to us. And in fact, the analogy would be perfect if you took that 15 pound bowling ball and put it on a uh, like a, a pizza pan that's 12 inches in diameter, because that's the size of the, of the sample head. And so you can think about, this is a very weak surface that we ended up flying into and um, offered almost no resistance at all. And unfortunately, the thing that actually tripped the, uh, the sample acquisition and then the backway maneuver was a clock that, that we had on board as part of the algorithm. We had thought about these types of scenarios and were worried that there could be a potential, like if this was a really just kind of a fluff ball or a bunch of dust, you could end up flying your entire arm or even the spacecraft into the surface and never even knowing it. So we had a time of touch clock going on the spacecraft and once it was close, it said, okay, I should be touching the surface within about five seconds or so. And once it didn't see that signal from the touchdown from the, from the uh, tag SAM arm, it said, okay, we're gonna blow the nitrogen bottle and then start the back wave maneuver all on our own because we've probably touched, touched the surface. And in fact, that's, that's what happened. So once we started to get the images down, again, these are some still frames from the video I showed you earlier. So this, this yellow circle here shows the actual touchdown spot. And in that movie, um, this was kind of the last frame just as we were starting to make contact. And this set of images, of course, is very interest, interested, interesting to us. And we spent a lot of time in those first few days trying to understand what was happening. And once you start to look at the images and you play the movie for a while and you kind of look at what's going on, you can start to make sense out of it. And in fact, of course, we made a big mess in certain areas on the surface, but there were other areas like our circle here, like surface one, surface two, and surface three over here, where we didn't do anything to the surface. So we could use those as landmarks to help us understand what was happening with all this other stuff that's flying around. And so in particular, we were kind of interested in these things that are just tumbling all around. This thing that looks kind of smooth right here, initially a lot of people were thinking, oh, that's kind of a resurfaced area that we forced into a burn. But we found out later that that was actually a plume that was sort of following the spacecraft as we were backing away. And of course this rock does a lot of interesting things. Um, just to give you an idea of scale, it's about the size of a men's shot foot. So it's a little over five inches in diameter. And now I'm gonna show you just two kind of zoomed in videos of the interesting micro uh, gravity things that were going on and showing you how weak some of these rocks actually were. So the first video I'm gonna show you is a zoomed in version looking at this rock that's tumbling and then this rock here which is also kind of tumbling but it's not high enough and it actually really impacts the surface so here's that bright rock in the low, that was on the lower left and then if you look on the right hand side you can see this other rock that's flying around but it's actually going to impact this larger rock that was unperturbed on the surface and you can see it basically hits it mostly breaks apart and kind of rolls off back to the surface. And then that shows you in reverse so you can help your eye kind of follow what's going on. So you can see what we think was happening was all these larger bodies was were colliding with each other and kind of creating just this uh, mess and plume of smaller particles that you see. And I'll show you in the next. So in the next video, I'm going to show you zoomed in on that other white rock that's about the size of a men's shot foot you'll see some interesting stuff going on there as well. So the bright rock kind of comes up through the plume, you can see it here, and then two other rocks kind of bunch up against it. And the one that's at the top actually gets hit from the outside and kind of gets destroyed. It sort of gets cleaved and cut into a couple of pieces. And you can see stuff just sort of flying around. So this is very interesting. Again, this one will play in reverse as well. So for the first day and a half or so that we had these images, everybody was trying to figure out what was happening. There were arguments going on about what we were seeing and if we had really you know, built the berm or if that plume that was being ejected from the surface. And so it was all very exciting, very fun and all new. And we're actually still sort of having discussions about what really happened here. But um, like was mentioned in the video, it was in the plan to go back and start imaging now with SAMCAM and start looking at that sample head and try to figure out how much sample we had actually uh, gotten. So on October 22, we took this series of images using SAMCAM and it was sort of good news, bad news. The good news was if you looked at the inside of the head, if you looked at 
kind of through the mesh here, it looked like we had gotten a lot of material as part of the sample acquisition, which was great. That's what we wanted. Unfortunately, as is obvious, you can see we're also losing a lot of the material. And we found that anytime we, we move the TAGSAM arm or the spacecraft around, all of a sudden we would lose material out of the head. And so this was very um, disconcerting. Um, and we sort of stopped looking at all that interesting tag data with all the interesting microgravity stuff and surface strength um, information and started to wonder what was happening here and try to really understand what was happening. And so those images came down on Thursday. By the next day on Friday, October 23, um, we had a done a bunch of image analysis, fortunately not me, but mostly graduate students had actually gone through and counted all all the particles that they could see escaping, and then also tried to do a hand count of the material that looked like it was inside that sample head. It looked like we had acquired probably several hundred grams of material, which was good news. The mission success criteria was only 60 grams, but we also found that anytime we move things around, we were losing about 10 grams a time. So that became very um, concerning to us. And in fact, the next day on Saturday, we made a presentation to the NASA headquarters and said, we recommend that we skip all that stuff we talked about doing that was gonna take about a week and a half and was shown in the video I was showing you earlier, where we try to measure using conservation of angular momentum, how much material is in there. We recommended we cut out anything that would involve either moving the arm or moving the spacecraft that wasn't involved in just trying to get the sample stowed into the sample return capsule safely. And so fortunately, Saturday that Saturday afternoon, headquarters agreed that, yeah, we concur. You guys just got to try to save as much sample as you can. And so at that point, we started almost around the clock support to try to expedite um, getting the sample into the sample return capsule, minimizing losing any more material. Um, and so by Tuesday of the following week, we were ready to open the sample return capsule. That was on a Tuesday. Later that Tuesday and then early Wednesday, um, we took the tag SAM head and had it stowed into the sample return capsule. And then on Wednesday, we did some tests to prove to ourselves that in fact the sample head was securely stowed. And then later on that Wednesday, we cut the uh, nitrogen tubes that were connecting the head to the rest of the arm and also blew a frange of bolt on the wrist. That was a, the mechanical connection. Um, so then we moved the arm out of the way and then later on that Wednesday, close to midnight, um, we were able to close the SRC and we were able to do all this um, five days ahead of the original schedule. And we think we saved a lot of material by doing that. So now I'm gonna show you uh, a series of images we took using Stowcam that we were taking. So unlike the sample acquisition attempt, this all had to be man involved, man on the ground. So we would do a step look at the sensors, look at the images, make sure everything was going properly before we would proceed to the next step. So these series of images that I'm gonna show you took place over about 28 hours, um, but they last only you know a few uh, 40 seconds or so. So here we are opening the sample return capsule. And then once we knew that was open safely, then we moved the arm into place and started to put the head into the sample return capsule. There you can see two of the three latches engaging. And then later that day, we started to pull on it to make sure it was in there safely. And then one, once we were convinced it was, we blew the frangible, bolt, cut the tube and moved the forearm out of the way. And then we closed up the SRC and declared, declared it a success. And there you can still see some of the particles in the background floating around. So we believe that we've successfully acquired at least 60 grams of material from Bennu. Uh, we think there's still probably at least 200, maybe even 300 grams of material. So well above the minimum threshold for mission, mission success. Um, the spacecraft is healthy and well, it's ready for its return cruise to earth. And now that we sort of all that settled down, we're back to arguing about what all that um, interesting things that were going on after we made contact with the surface. And in fact, this is sort of breaking news. It's not really publicly known yet. Um, originally, it was a mission rule agreed to with headquarters that once we had a sample and once we had it stowed, we wouldn't do anything more to jeopardize that sample or take any additional risk 
before bringing that sample back to earth. But because we're so intrigued by what we did to the surface and trying to understand from the imagery what happened, we have decided to do another flyby of the surface, which up until about four weeks ago was not in the plan. So right now the plan is to fly back over the surface on April 6th and try to help to try to help us understand exactly what we did to the surface and what it looks like now after we made contact. Um, our departure burn right now is nominally planned for May 10th, so just a few months away. We have a backup date of May 24. Um, but no matter when we leave, we're going to land in September of 2023 in the Dugway Proving Grounds. And in fact, all the geochemists on the project say that's when the real science actually begins. So once that sample return capsule lands back in Utah, um, it'll be taken to a facility at the Johnson Space Center where we curate all the planetary samples at NASA has ever returned. So here are some actual pictures from it on the left. And in fact, uh, our project has paid quite a bit of money to upgrade that facility. You can see the planned upgrades are here on the right. And those samples from Bennu will go to this facility along with all the other planetary samples that NASA has. And then uh, geochemists and other researchers who specialize in in situ um, examination of things like these will be able to get samples and analyze them. And we expect really the, the most exciting science is, is yet to come. And we just had a meeting earlier this week with the folks that do that work, reminding us that even though most of the mission's done and even after the samples return back to, back to Earth, the mission is still officially going on for two years. So part of the team that does geochemistry will be actively working with these Bennu samples for at least two more years after the samples come back. So. Um, that's all I have for you tonight. Um, happy to answer questions. Looks like we're about 20 after the hour. So if anybody has anything they'd like to ask, be happy to answer for you. Um, first of all, thank you, Brent. Uh, wow, a lot to take in. Um, we had a couple of questions that are in the chat. If you want to open that up um, to view that, okay. there were a couple of questions that we had um, there. And then I've... See. I'll start with the... First one first. Um, okay, so this is from Carlton. It says, how difficult was it to determine the density of the target asteroid at the point of impact where the samples obtained? Was there much concern regarding damage, the mechanism at point of contact? Um, and then what are the challenges the team faces dealing with the temperatures that the OSIRIS-REx has to function in? So first question, um, so our initial estimate of, this, of the density were from ground-based observations and looking at how the orbit was changing. Um, fortunate, so I didn't talk about it, but one of the other nice side effects of those particles was um, because the body's not a sphere, the density actually changes as you, as you fly around it. So there are parts of the body where you accelerate and other parts where you go slower. And so we actually used, this wasn't part of the original plan, but we actually, all the orbits that we had determined for those particles that were being ejected, they helped us develop a, a much more accurate gravity model than we thought um, that we originally thought we could. And so that's what we used to refine our density estimates. But of course, we didn't know exactly, you know, that, that could take place kind of anywhere in the surface. And we didn't really know what the near surface behavior would be like. Um, the low density sort of would, should have given us even a, a stronger feeling that this is probably kind of a loosely consolidated rock pile and not like, you know, a bunch of granite that just has a fine dust, uh, dusting of material around it. And so a lot of the folks uh, kept pointing to that because we're, there were some rocks on the surface that looked like they were actually very solid. I didn't go into that, but there was a big discussion um, through parts of the observation phase as to what the surface strength was really like. And you can kind of see in the, you know, the animations that I was showing you in the, in the video clips kind of gave you the idea of what we kind of thought we would get, that you would get kind of a nice layer of sort of sand and gravel, but that you might hit something hard. But we never did. Like I said, it was just like plowing through, you know, freshly fallen snow. Um, and in terms of the temperature variation, um, yeah, that's all. So we model all that in advance and all the, all the uh, spacecraft hardware is designed to operate both in cold and in hot environments. Most of the time we're cold and most of most things don't like to operate when they're cold. So almost every instrument, all the mechanisms will have some kind of heater on them. So we'll monitor the temperature and if it gets too cold, 
uh, we'll turn on the heaters and get them warmed up. Usually you're trying to get things to at least about, you know, negative 25 degrees C. Most things are happy enough to be that cold. And so the cameras I was responsible for, we had a whole process where we would, before we would do anything, we would warm them up uh, for about an hour and get them, get them to that warm and mo or get into that temperature. And most of the time, um, you know, they were on the colder side. Most of the time we didn't get that hot. Um, let me go to the next one. So when planning the mission, how much information can be attained regarding potential collisions with other objects? Um, I don't know if Carplin's on, I'm not really sure. I mean, objects like Bennu or just flying out to Bennu where we worried about running into, into something. Just, just avoiding anything that might be in, in its path. Yeah, we, so that's part of these normal missions. Um, you think about like, you know, there's this asteroid belt, which, you know, is fairly heavily populated, but mostly space is just empty space. So the odds of actually hitting something are, are relatively low. We actually did, you know, I didn't point it out. Let me show you since you asked though. Let me uh, get back, see if I can close this a minute. See if I can show it to you. So I'm not going to run this animation. You see this, you see this black dot right here on the SRC? We actually did collide with something that put a little divot into the SRC. It's about uh, three millimeters in, in length. And we actually hit something on the way out to Bennu. And we actually had to do an analysis using the Stoke, a Stokeham image just like this to determine if, how deep it was and if it was going to be an issue. Um, we don't think it is. So this whole top, this white part of the spacecraft will ablate or sort of get removed as we go, as it hits the uh, friction or the friction from the Earth's atmosphere. This material is going to start to come off anyway. And so the people that um, are worried about the spacecraft and worried about the SRC said this is, this is a non-issue. But we didn't happen to, uh, you know, hit something very small, probably something, you know, smaller than the diameter of the hair hit us at a high velocity and put a little divot in us. But um, yeah, there is an analogy, you know, there's the big objects in the solar system are all known. And of course we knew where those were and, and knew we wouldn't get close to them. We did do the earth flyby. So there was a potential, obviously, if we didn't do something right, we could have hit earth, we could have hit the moon, but um, you know, we're able to navigate pretty accurately in space, particularly when we have these cameras on board to figure out where we are. So um, not, not a lot of risk associated with hitting anything. All right, let me get back. Let's see. There's a question about future plans for the spacecraft. Yeah, so um, this really isn't public knowledge either, but we have published in a few places. So right now, um, you know, we're sort of breaking our rule we're, and headquarters has, has agreed for us to go do this April 6 flyby. But then the plan is on May 10 to fly back to, to Earth and then the sample return capsule will return to Earth. And at that point, the spacecraft part of the OSIRIS-X mission is done. Um, but right now we're currently thinking we're gonna fly to another asteroid, another near Earth asteroid in 2029. It's the asteroid called Apophis. And it's made a big splash when it was discovered a few years ago because it has, it's going to make a real close flyby to the Earth closer than even most um, communication satellites. And so there's going to be a lot of interest from the public, we think, to study that body. And so right now um, we're doing, it was just uh, yesterday actually, we were having a meeting trying to put together a proposal because we need more money to do that. Our funding um, doesn't include follow-on things like that. So we have to, we'll have to propose what we do with the spacecraft to headquarters. But we think that has a pretty good idea of being selected. And we actually have enough fuel to go in orbit about Apophis. And there's a lot of talk that because Apophis is going to come so close to Earth that gravity, gravity may change the shape. There might be enough tidal forces on it that you might see a change in shape of the body, particularly if it's a weak rubble pile like Bennu is. Um, and then also there's a chance that it could change how it's spinning about its axis, that it might um, either cause it to tumble more or actually create tumbling. So there's sort of these orbital dynamics questions that are interesting to look at. Um, and of course, we also wanna do 
this particle search, because this is a different type of near-Earth asteroid. Uh, Apophis is an S-type asteroid. And so one of the other questions to kind of look at the hypothesis of are these particle ejections from Bennu caused by just the micrometeoroid flux that we see in, kind of in the vicinity of Earth, do we see that same type of thing happen on Apophis? And if we see the same type of rates of ejections, then that really lends itself to that hypothesis that you know, most of these events are probably caused by it getting hit by uh, other micrometeoroids. Okay. Um, John Farish, you have a question? Uh, yeah, uh, one of the interesting things about this mission to me was that asteroid Bennu is now one of the best mapped objects in our solar system. Uh, but of course, all of that mapping was done before a new crater was created by OSIRIS-REx. So I'm wondering if we're going to get some updated assets from uh, NASA to, to show off in the planetarium. And if I may, just one other quick question. I was wondering about whether the uh, sampled material will need to be protected from oxidation and how they go about that when they retrieve it in 2023. So uh, like I said, we will, we are going to make these follow-up observations on uh, April 6th, which is really great because every we're all kind of clamoring for it because in particular it could, you know, resolve some arguments people are having about what happened and, and uh, you know, what we did to the surface. So that'll be, that'll be really, really interesting. Um, there are no plans to go back to Bennu with another spacecraft. There's, it's kind of been a real renaissance time in terms of asteroid studies, which wasn't kind of my area. I was doing a lot of Mars stuff, particularly in graduate school. Um, but we have another, another asteroid mission called Lucy, which is launching next October that I've been supporting at Goddard. It's another Goddard mission. Um, and there's another mission called Psyche, which is going to some other asteroids. So there's been a lot of... Um, interest in studying asteroids at the NASA headquarters level for about the last 10 years. And we've kind of now, once uh, uh, Lucy and Psyche get off the ground and, and get to where they're going, we've kind of done a pretty good job of looking at kind of the range of different asteroid bodies. Um, you might have heard about the mission Dawn, which went to um, Ceres and Vesta, which are two uh, of the largest, one's the largest asteroid and was the first one discovered because it was so big. So, and then in the next few years here, we'll have a pretty good understanding of kind of the breadth of asteroids in our solar system. And so I think um, a lot of the funding will probably start to go to other places. And so I'm, I'm personally hoping for Venus uh, starts to get attention because that's, uh, I'm currently supporting the Venus proposal for to send a probe down to the surface. So. Um, yeah, there's no plans to go back to, to Bennu. We know a lot about it. We we're actually talking about highlighting in our proposal to headquarters how um, because it's so well cataloged and uh, you know we understand the surface so well now that folks that look at planetary protection and what you would do to try to divert an asteroid or break it up, um, we just recently found out our, our data set is being used as sort of the primary example because it's so well known. So but right now there's no plans to go back to Bennu and I'd be surprised if we did. Brent, um, it was evident, you know, it was interesting when you uh, went through that uh, frame by frame on the um, ejecta that came out of the crater and following those because it gave us kind of that physical representation. I mean, John just mentioned, yes, you've mapped the objects and we, we call them rocks, okay? But that's using our earth analogy, our earth analog and our rocks, like you said, granite, marble, sandstone, limestone. The impression that when you said these, these rocks collided and actually broke apart in this, you know, in this frame by frame analysis indicates that rocks on Bennu is really just something barely more than aggregated material that it's so weak that even just the ejection from a puff of nitrogen can cause them to fracture and collide. And of course, it does beg the question about how they even got aggregated into their the size that they are. So it'll be really interesting when we get, the, uh, of course, when the sample return comes back, you know, they will be able to get the ide um, you know, true values of the densities of these, these objects. But just from what you were showing, it not it evident that they are, it is significantly less dense than any rocks that we associate with here on a terrestrial 
um, sphere. True. Yeah, in fact, so a lot of the, at least a lot of the smaller objects and not this image of the SRC here, um, except for that one sort of dark area, you can see a lot of little other dark areas. So one thing I, I have been spending a lot of time on, those are actually pieces of Bennu. And if you look at those, and if you look at some of the other material that was obviously escaping from the head, we've called the, we've tended to call those uh, uh, like cornflakes. They kind of look like flakes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. And, you know, with, with almost soft edges. And so, yeah, it's very, it's so different. You know, we're, we're not very good at being creative and sort of thinking outside of our own normal experiences, even though, you know, some of the folks on the project, that's all they think about this kind of thing all the time, particularly ones not involved with the hardware. And it's just surprising how much we thought about it and how little we really predicted what was going to happen. And I'm, I'm reminded of this, well, we kind of had a similar thing on Phoenix where the, the surface just, and maybe David remembers this, where the surface just didn't act like we expected it to act like and actually getting the sample to prove there was water at our landing site took a lot of work. And many of you may have recently heard on our uh, one of our latest Mars probe called InSight, they recently gave up trying to dig. They, there's this uh, uh, temperature experiment that they were trying to dig. It was trying to dig itself into the surface of Mars. And they've been trying for two years to get that thing to go down into any kind of depth and they use all kinds of tricks. And they've recently just given up. So, you know, what we call, so we, we call, you know, you talk about dirt or rocks. I think yeah. I, I was able to avoid using the term regolith. But, you know, when we talk about planetary sort of soil, because soil sort of intimates, you know, carbon or organic material. So we call loosely aggregated material or soil or sand is called regolith. But anytime we try to sort of interact with planetary regolith, it, we're, we're, it's always throws us for a loop and sometimes we're not able to overcome it like in the case of InSight. Fortunately, you know, we had a lot of contingencies built into OSIRIS-REx to be able to, to uh, gather that sample. But one, you know, one of the things to think about is especially early on when I used to talk about OSIRIS-REx when we were kind of still in the planning stages, people would talk about, well, why don't you land and sort of you know, grab onto the surface and dig into it, this, you know, this gas thing this doesn't seem like you're going to get much and it's not going to work. And I thought it was a valid, um, you know, question and, and sort of criticism. But you can see now how difficult that, if we would have tried to sort of lock ourselves into place, probably couldn't have happened. And, we, and trying to dig, you know, trying to hold yourself securely in a microgravity environment and then dig with any kind of strength probably would have been almost impossible. So it it's, ends up being kind of lucky what we, what we ended up, doing to try to get the sample. It worked pretty well. Yeah, this would not have worked to have tried to have, you know, fired the pythons, the pythons and grab onto the surface and hold on. I mean, it was so soft. The lander would have just sunk into it. I mean, like you say, like snow, who would have guessed? Yeah. Yeah, so it was, yeah, it was very interesting. And I mean, there, there may be other parts on the surface that are harder, of course. And it, we kind of alluded to it in the video. Um, you know, most people would think we went to the most scientifically interesting place, but really we went to the safest place that still had scientific value. So if you look at that, you know, carbonate map, I'll, I'll pull that up again here. You can see, let's see if I can make this go again, go through all this. You can see we didn't go where, you know, there was a high density of carbonate material because it wasn't, it wasn't safe. So here it is. So the darker purple areas here show you we think there was a lot of uh, permanent material, which, you know, from a science standpoint was more enticing. But, of course, you see kind of where that purple area is. It, there's all these hard, you know, these hard rocks that we would worry about. Um, so actually now a lot of people are going, you know, I wonder if those rocks would have just broken apart as we flew oh. into them. But, of course, you know, no one would want to take that risk. Yeah, like you say, if it's it's got the structure of a cornflake, you know, it only looks, cru you know, the the appearance versus the uh, contact is a different, whole different experience. But not going to take a with you know two astronomic two AU away from Earth. <laughs> that's a risk not worth taking. Yeah, so let's see. Uh, there's a few more questions in the chat. What do you think the maximum capture particle size might be? You know, we're not really sure. We didn't see a good view. Um, you know, through the little mesh that we could see some of the samples, some of the stuff that was escaping, you know, was, was fairly small. So maybe, you know, half an inch or something like that. We don't expect 
anything really huge. We're hoping we get pretty good sizes, um, you know, and then people can break that open and look inside. Is um, there a maximum size that's that's capable? Is there a limit? Yeah, but I, I don't recall what it was. So if you remember that animation, you know, those flat there, if you kind of paid attention, these these flaps would open up and that would keep, you know, certain material from from getting from getting through there. But I don't recall what that was. You know, it was probably something about this size. Okay. Um, you know, several several inches. It's hard to relate because you don't know the density. And so if you get 60, 100 ounces of material, um, you don't know how much mass each particle has. Right. Yep. Yeah. So and this is a, a great question I just see here. So is Nightingale more sandy because it was previously impacted? And that right. Like I like the sandy in quotation marks. That's a, that's actually right. We think Nightingale is actually a fairly recent crater um, that was ex ex excavated. So that's one of the reasons we think it looks so so nice. Um, but yeah. Um, there were a few others. So all, all the actually all the spots that we looked at, Osprey and the two others, they all looked like they were probably relatively fresh craters. And that was that was the big shock, of course. I think it was in that video a little bit when we got there. A lot of the geologists were saying this is gonna be kind of a big solid body with a nice thick layer of like sand and gravel. And, and the animations, you know, kind of show you that that we we're expecting to go through kind of a, a sandy gravelly area and then hit something hard and it didn't match our expectations of course but that's what makes this fun and pure exploration so it was it was great and it, it really was October 20 was a great day I mean it have been a long you know two years studying the object um, me not being necessarily an asteroid expert I wasn't all that interested in the asteroid once we kind of solved the the problem of the uh, you know what was if something was being ejected it sort of became a grind daily to you know, it, it's it's funny you get used what you get used to, right? Every day you're looking at pictures no one else has seen, but you do get used to it. But definitely October 20th, in particular, when we were able to execute all that those emergency operations successfully and get the asteroid sample stowed, it's definitely one of probably the top three things I've been involved with at NASA. It was really it was really great. Yeah, this provides a nice lead-in to a question that I have, and that is, uh, what is your next big thing? that you're going to be working on? Yeah, so right now we're finishing up um, another asteroid mission called Lucy, which is going out to the Jupiter Trojan asteroids and it's gonna do a bunch of flybys. That launches in next October. Right now, I'm not expecting to be involved with operations with that. We'll, we'll probably hand that over. There's a group at Southwest Research Institute. That's the lead academic institute for the mission. And so we'll give most of that work to them. Right now, the two big things I'm working on, which are kind of far out, I already mentioned one, it's called, it's a Venus probe called Da Vinci Plus. And that will be the first NASA Venus mission in I don't know how many years, 30 years or something like that. And it has a descent probe that will go through this, that will take images, um, take some gas samples, measure temperature all the way down to the surface and hopefully live for maybe a few hours on the surface, which, is, which would just be great. And then it also has an orbiter, which we'll use to study the uh, Martian atmosphere or the uh, Venus atmosphere for a couple of years as well. So that's called Da Vinci Plus. And um, right now we're kind of finishing up. We've done a bunch of work on it and headquarters has to decide in the next few months whether or not they want to fund that. And because of the, there's been a recent interesting discovery um, recently of Venus and potentially life uh, living in the in the clouds. That there's this sort of narrow area where we could actually have life living. So there's a lot been a lot of attention recently with Venus. And fortunately, our our descent probe could actually help look at that question um, a little bit. So we're hoping we have kind of a competitive advantage, and that headquarters will select us. Um, the other big thing I'm working on, which is even further down the road, is a Mars sample return mission, which is multiple launches, multiple spacecraft. Um, but we're working on that right now with the European Space Agency. So we'll I'll, I'll have to make a decision probably in the next six to eight months. If Da Vinci Plus gets selected, that's going to be a, a pretty all-consuming job, and they may have to dial back the Mars sample return support, but we'll just have to see. But those are the two big things, Mars sample return and this Da Vinci probe. And um, both of them are, are, you know, 
as exciting as Osiris Rex to me and the other Mars stuff I've done. So looking forward to, to making those work. It is true that Venus has been kind of neglected amongst the major planets. And I suppose there part of the reason is the difficulty with the intense heat. Yeah, is nothing sur can survive very long there. You know, it's right. like 500 degrees Fahrenheit with, you know, hydrochloric acid raining out of the atmosphere. Um, but yeah, this, and this is another, this is another, this Da Vinci Plus is kind of like Osiris-Rex. It's been proposed a number of times. Um, headquarters always gives it high marks and says, well, I don't know if it's quite ready or we don't want to quite spend money on that yet. It kind of feels like it's about, you know, it's kind of time. There's another Venus proposal that we're competing with as well. Right now we're kind of hoping that it's a very different mission from ours, mainly a radar mission. We're kind of hoping both missions will get selected and there'll be kind of a renaissance of Venus exploration now since it's all been about Mars and kind of a lot of the outer planets and like I was saying, asteroids until recently. Um, so I'm really hoping this Venus thing will be really neat. Like I've gone to Mars now quite a few times. It, you know, this will be, Lucy will be my second asteroid mission. This will be the first time I've done anything involving Venus and it's all brand new to me and all the challenges are very different than going to an airless, you know, cold body like, like Bennu or going to Mars, which is, you know, pretty benign when you compare it to, uh, to Venus. Wow. Anybody else, Chris? Uh, no, we don't have any. Um, oh, about, oh, uh, there was a question here in, uh, about how many years old is a relatively fresh crater? Of course, this is in, yeah, I mean, we're talking in astronomical um, time scale, so. Yeah, I don't know if I, you know, I've heard, but usually you're talking, you know, maybe, maybe a million years or, you know, something like that. We actually, so I, I didn't, so there's so much interesting stuff and I went through it really quickly and I just, you know, there's, there's stuff I have to skip over because I kind of want to get to the stuff I thought was sort of interesting and new. But we really think that Bennu was actually part of a larger asteroid at one point and went through a very large collision very, on, very early on in the formation of the solar system. And there was a paper that part of the team, I wasn't involved with it, but um, they put out right around the time of TAG. And in fact, that bright rock I was showing you spinning around, not the one that was in the plume, although that could be one too. Um, but the, what this study showed was that a lot of those bright rocks that are on the surface and kind of stand out from the rest of the body, which is, is, is really low in reflectivity. I didn't mention that either, but this really is like a piece of charcoal. It's only about 3% reflective. And all the instruments we designed for this had to be designed to operate with very little sunlight coming back and actually made it difficult when we did those earth flybys to image the moon and the earth because they were just too bright for most of our instruments. So it took a lot of work in changing parameters to try to get anything good out of it. Um, but the, um, now what was I talking about now? <laughs> oh uh, yeah, how, how, so most of the body is about 3% reflective, but you, on some of the um, big, sort of landscape shots that were shown. Again, that rock that was spinning around. This study that was, that was put out in the fall from part of our team did an analysis of a lot of those bright rocks, which are dramatically different than the rest of the body. And spectrally, using the spectrometers, both Oviers and that other, that thermal infrared spectrometer, they looked at the spectra and it was so different than the rest of the body. And actually the only other body that that spectra matched in the solar system is Vesta. So there's some thought actually that, that this body at some point had been either interacted with Vesta or had been in a point in its orbit that it was able to acquire some of the material off of Vesta because it almost matches perfectly spectra, in a spectral sense, um, Vesta. So we've actually, a lot of those bright rocks um, within the, when we see those in the team, we call those potential Vestoids because we think there's a chance that that those actually came from Vesta. So Bennu's had a very interesting history, we think. It was probably part of a much bigger object, probably in the uh, main asteroid belt in between Jupiter and Mars, collided with something else which perturbed its orbit and a piece of it broke off and sent it, you know, close to Earth. And then with the sunlight operating on it over time, put it into the orbit that we see today. Cool. Chris, we're uh, getting the word from the people at the bookstore that they'll be closing in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, so I see, let's see, one other question it looks like from Carlton about B-type and S-types of asteroids. So um, just a little more background on asteroids. We think asteroids are sort of the leftover planetesimals at the larger, um, or at least all the terrestrial planets form from. And so um, the, the name B-type and S-type usually is associated with their colors, at least when people first started to, to look at them. And so C-type asteroids are generally believed to be um, you know, kind of a carbonaceous um, or B type it has a lot of carbon associated with it. So um, in terms of their evolution, um, yeah, I'm not really sure, not being necessarily an asteroid expert, I'm not sure how much that tells us about the early solar system. But again, we think it's possible that these types of bodies seeded Earth with organic material. There's thoughts that, you know, comets um, seeded Earth with, with water. Those are the types of hypotheses that, you know, folks that really study this all day long, you know, think about. Okay, I think uh, any further questions? Last call for questions. Just a comment, thank you. That was a great presentation and a lot of good information. Yes. Uh, Definitely, Brent, on behalf of the group uh, and myself, uh, thank you for accepting the invitation to be with us this evening. Uh, you'll be hearing about hearing from me, and uh, then I'll be checking in with you in a few years to come back and talk to us about Venus. <laughs> <coughs> or whatever. Oh, let's hope. We'll, we'll know come May time frame. Yep. Okay, great. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. Again. Thank you all for participating. It's been a good, good gathering. And uh, thanks, Chris. Okay. Yes. Thanks, You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night.